Collins, what it, Collins, what it do? Giving is receiving. In other words, your generous giving releases the blessing. Your generous giving releases the blessing. But let me put a caution, star, exclamation point on this. It's important that you know the motivation and the purpose of your giving is not to receive. If that's why you're giving to get, well, we lost you already. God's lost you. You're not in the plan and purpose of God. Your generous giving releases the blessing. Why would we want to walk in the blessing? Because God wants us blessed to be a blessing. God wants his kingdom established in the earth. God wants attention drawn to his blessing on your life because you are a generous giver so that they will, people will want to know the God you serve, which would ultimately lead to souls being one to the kingdom of God. That's the whole purpose of being a generous giver, that people would know God and become saved. Amen. So he told Abraham, in Genesis 12, too, amen, just, just, just recapping, think about Abraham. How many of you know Abraham is the father of us all? That because of what happened um, on the cross, Galatians 3.29 says that we are descendants of Abraham. We're Abraham's seed. He's our father. We're his heir. We're part of his family. So any blessing that was put on Abraham is our blessing. And he told, God told Abraham, he says, I will bless you and make you famous and you will be a blessing to others. All the families of the earth will be blessed through you. So you can put yourself in here. You can say, I, Cynthia, thank you, God that you are blessing me and making me famous and that I, Cynthia, will be a blessing to others and all the families on the earth will be blessed through Cynthia. You, you make it first person, amen? Glory to God. And so that's already happened because in Ephesians 1, 3, God says he's blessed us with all spiritual blessing in heavenly places. In case you don't know, when you got born again, heaven moved on the inside of you. Now, now I'm not tripping. Heaven is still out there in the third heaven. But there is a heaven, the kingdom of God, that also lives in your spirit, man. The Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost took up residence on the inside of us. Aren't you glad your God can be omnipresent? He can be everywhere at the same time and nobody's slacking, nobody's missing or lacking. Amen. Glory to God. But the problem is the blessings on the inside of us and is in our spirit, man. And it ain't going to do you no good on lockdown in your spirit, man. We need to learn how to take it from your spirit, man, and manifest it in your natural world where you can partake of it to be a blessing in the earth. You know, God takes pleasure in our prosperity, according to Psalms 35, 27. Why? Why would he take pleasure in our prosperity? Well, Isaiah 61, 19 says, all who see them in their prosperity will recognize and acknowledge that they are the people whom the Lord has blessed. So what happens when you walk in the blessing and this particular blessing is your prosperity blessing, but hold up, prosperity just doesn't mean money. It means a blessed marriage. You walk in in a blessed um, um, body that's healthy and healed. You got a blessed mind. Your children are blessed. They're not wrecking your last <laughs> bit of sanity. Amen. Your, your finances are blessed. Do you understand? Your marriage is blessed. Prosperity means it all in one package. Amen. And so when you're walking in the blessing, you cause attention to, to God that first of all, people are looking at you and it gives you a great witness to talk to them about how you walk in the blessing that you walk in. You have a testimony to talk to them about your God. And that testimony gives God glory and can cause those people to come into his kingdom because they want to know the God you serve and be born again. Amen. 
So the question is, if it's all locked down in our spirit, man, how do we release this blessing in our lives? So glad you asked. It's your generous giving that releases the blessing. Not just giving finances, but generously giving of yourself, of your time, of your serving, of your caring, your loving, and giving of your finances. Being unselfish is what releases the blessing. Amen? So let's look at the Bible this morning and see what it shows us about being generously, um, generous givers and its results. Can we just walk through the Bible? So I come to teach you this morning. Amen. We're going through the Bible this morning. And we're going to see what it says about your generous giving and the results from it. Remembering, remembering students that God's purpose behind your generous giving is to establish the kingdom of God in the earth so that souls can be saved. Amen. So let's start first with Galatians 6, 6. And I'm reading this in the New Amplified. It says, the one who is taught in the word of God. Now, let's ask you a question. Are you being taught in the word of God? When you come every Sunday, do you feel you're being taught in the word of God? When you listen to our midweek breakdown, do you feel you're being taught in the word of God? When you go to brotherhood or sisterhood, do you feel you're being taught in the word of God? When you receive counsel, do you feel you're being taught in the word of God? Amen. So it says the one who is taught the word of God is to do what? Share all things with his teacher. Pause. I'm not referring to myself. I'm talking about the organization that teaches you. Where do you get your teaching from? Your church? Is that your teacher? Is that where your teaching comes from? that you're taught in, where is your primary place, your storehouse, where the word is for you? Now, let me help some of y'all too. If you've been sowing in dad in my life and any other minister that, that teaches the word of God physically, then this applies as well to us personally sowing. But for our teaching, I don't want you to think about giving into a personal person I want you to think about the organization, the storehouse where your word is stored up that you come and be fed by. Amen. So what happens? Contributing to his, it says, the one who is taught the word of God is to share all good things with his teacher, the organization that teaches them the word of God, contributing to his spiritual and material support. Now, is there any part of spiritual that we don't understand, that means you serving, you praying, you interceding, you doing what you can to make sure the spiritual part of this house moves forward, that people, you ushering, you know, all of it. You taking care of the kids in the children's ministry, parking lot attendance, um, events, whatever it is you do, security, you know, everything. That's your spiritual support all the way to intercessory prayer. Amen. And then it says material support. Is there any part of material support you're not understanding? If that, that could be finances or you could see a lack and maybe you want to purchase something to f fulfill the lack. You take out of your material stuff, whether it's your money or, or whatever you can purchase, and you fulfill the lack. So what does that say? If you see lack in this church... If you see things not happening spiritual where you would like to see more outreach um, or us taking care of, of doing food drives or having a shelter or whatever, well, well, ever, well, God calls the assembly of people to come that are fed by the word to take care of those things. So if it ain't happening, that means there's a possibility that there are people amongst that call themselves family members who have joined this ministry, this church, are not adding their spiritual and material support. Because God draws enough people to make sure his vision is taken care of. And where there's a big vision, if you have expectation and you are determined I'm going to be a generous giver, you will see great provision. But you got to be faithful over the little before you get the great provision. And then you got to remember God gives me power to give wealth to do what? To do what? 
to establish his covenant. And what's that? Being a blessing, blessed to be a blessing. Why? Why? We want souls. We want souls, right? So next time you're complaining about what's not happening, make sure you're adding your supply spiritually and materially and encourage others to be on board too. Amen. And intercede that people will have a willing, giving, cheerful heart to give to God's work so that his work and vision can be fulfilled in the household of victory in D.C. Okay, well, let me hurry up. I see my time is running, and I haven't even got off the first scripture, Galatians 6. Let's, verse, let's look at verses 7 through 9 in the King James, because we said giving is receiving, and your generous giving releases the blessing. And we're answering the question, well, how do we get that blessing that was on the inside of us to show up in our physical world? We found out in verse 6, what does this do? God says in response to your generous giving, be not deceived. God is not mocked, for whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. If you're going to be selfish, stock, stock, pile it up all to yourself. Won't share. Don't have time to come and serve. Don't have time to intercede. Don't, it's all about you. Oh, mm -mm, some reaping of corruption we might see eventually in your life. Don't be fooled by what looks good right now because this word will come to pass. But he that soweth to the Spirit, and God says in his word in John 6, 63, that, that his word is spirit and life. So he that soweth to the word shall of the Spirit, the word, reap life everlasting. This word life everlasting is not talking about heaven. It comes from the Hebrew word, I mean the, um, the, the Greek word zoe, which means abundant life. Sounds like John 10, 10. Jesus came to give us life more abundantly, abundant life. Amen. So look at what your giving does when you're supporting the place where God has called you. Then God says, now, wait a minute. He's, he's, he's putting a personal um, qualifier on it. He says, now, look, I guarantee this. I'm not going to be mocked, made fun of. I'm putting myself on the line. And I'm telling you, if you give to the word of God that you're taught in, I'm telling you, you're going to see manifestation of an abundant life. Amen. And then he encouraged us, let us not be weary in well-doing, verse 9, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. So don't quit. Don't allow yourself because it's taken a long time to think it's not working. Just stay the course. The helper's in you to help you. The strengthener's in you to strengthen you. Hebrews 2.18, Jesus is there to run to your aid so that you won't faint, but you got to have expectation for it. You got to call it. You got to know some word. God, God, look, God, faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Y'all need to go back and make sure you have a B-I-B-L-E and you bring it to church, whether it's in your iPad, your iPhone, your Samson, or you got a physical body, Bible. You cannot manifest any abundant life. See, God moving your life without a B-I-B-L-E, and you got to read it more than on Sunday. It needs to be an everyday time in it because faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God, and you're only going to receive the grace of God by faith. If you don't know what belongs to you, how you going to believe for it? You got your faith is the word you know, not what you think, what you know currently, what you just read, what's living in you alive. What word, what scripture? If you ain't got a scripture and a word that's living in you alive, you don't have faith yet. Just spend some more time in that word till it explodes on the inside of you, and then you'll feel like standing and having all the done stand, you'll stand forever. Because it won't matter. Because you know it's yours. That's why you don't have to worry about getting weary and well-doing. And you will reap. And then look at Galatians 6.10. It says, I'm reading this in the Amplified Classic. It says, so then, as, it says, so then, as occasion and opportunity opens up to us, let us do good morally to all people, not only being useful or profitable to them, but also doing what is for their spiritual good and advantage. Be mindful to be a blessing, especially to those in the household of faith, those who belong to God's family with you, the believers. 
See, 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 you need to meditate on stuff like this. When you're struggling about whether I should sow a seed into someone's life and you think God unctioned you to pay for somebody's registration for the women's con, and you're going, oh, was that God or was that me? I really was going to get this new dress I wanted to wear for the women's conference. And God is like, I'm trying to set you up, honey, to walk in the blessing. I got more for you than just a dress. Well, you look at this scripture, that settles it. Your sister's in lack. I got the finances. Sow it into them if God is leading you. We just want to do what God is telling you. That's all. Not just what God is telling you. If he's not telling you, then don't worry about it. You just need to be obedient to what he's speaking in your life. Well, let's see how else we look at how this giving generously releases the blessing. Let's look at the Philippian church and their divine connection to Paul. Do you realize the Philippi um, church, they're partakers of Paul's grace, the blessing on his life, and it's all because of their generous giving towards his ministry. So let's look in Philippians 4.14 where we see Paul is encouraging the Philippians about their generous giving and the power of the blessing it releases. So reading in the voice, verse 4.14 of Philippians, nevertheless, it was admirable of you to participate in my affliction. You remember Philippians at the beginning of my gospel journey after I left Macedonia. No church offered me the financial assistance I needed to do the Lord's work except you alone. Even when I took the message to Thessalonica, you sent provisions to me twice even. In the Passion Translation, they, they said the Philippi church supported Paul for well over a year. They supported his ministry so that he, they could advance the kingdom of God work he was doing. Verse 17, he says, not that I'm looking for a gift. I'm just looking toward your reward that comes from your gift. With that with what Aphrodite delivered to me from your generous pockets, I have been blessed in excess. I am fully satisfied. I know God is pleased with your dedication and accepts this gift as a fragrant offering, a holy sacrifice on his behalf. I'm telling you, your generous giving releases the blessing. This is why Paul makes this statement next in response to their generous giving. Verse 19, know this, my God will also fill every need you have according to his glorious riches in Jesus the anointing, our liberating king. What he's saying is, do y'all hear that? He's saying the same God that provides for me at my level, my level of being an apostle, the things I need to carry out God's ministry, the wealth that I need to accomplish his vision, his vision in the earth, the same God that supplies for me at my level will supply for you at your level because of your generous giving. The same grace that is up on me gets up on you. Whatever you need, the wisdom, the anointing, the miraculous power of God, you can call upon the anointing and the grace of Apostle Paul. You've been sowing into Victor Christian ministry. Ministry. Some of you have been sowing in our lives personally. I'm telling you the same anointing, the same power that is up on Victory Christian Ministry, that is up on Pastor Tyrone and myself, you got a right to, you can tap into it, and you can flow in it at that level of receiving. The same blessing, the same reward is accounted unto you. Amen? And then check this out. Then the blessing is not at your level of riches, but it's out of God's glorious riches, his glorious inheritance. Oh, my God. In other words, blessing and ex to be excess and fully satisfied. Can't you just hear Amos um, 913, blessing, blessing upon blessing will begin to come on you so much until your head swims? Oh, my God, all because you're a generous giving to the vision of God, that God can release the blessing so why you can continue to be a blessing. And God, you know what? God doesn't want you not to have anything because he needs people to see you looking good. He needs people seeing you prosper so that they will be drawn to you. And, and, and 
In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, it tells you God gives you seed to sow, money to sow, things to sow, wealth to sow, and he gives you bread for your food. He gives you things to take care of your house, yourself, your life. But since it ain't yours and it all belongs to God, you need to inquire of him, God, what of this that I got is bread for my food and what is to be sown to be a blessing in the earth? And then how much, God, into whom? So that's like an everyday thing. You, it's not like a one-time visitation. Every day you arise is a new day full of God's loving kindness and tender mercies. Every day you need to be inquiring, God, how do you want me to be blessed to be a blessing? And, and don't be afraid. He's not going to always have you come out of your pocketbook. But you know what? If you hold money in such a high esteem, he will. He will because he's going to break that spirit of mammon off of you. So he will have you give, 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 till till you finally realize he's your source, not money. So you better loose yourself. You better stop holding your fist like this. It's hard to put anything in. You know, if you want, want, if I want something, it's hard for me to receive it from you if my fist is balled up like this. And a lot of us, when it comes to giving, we got a fist balled up like this. And then the blessing wants to come, but you have nowhere to take it because you got a balled up fist. Glory to God. Amen. But just remember this, God gives you power to get the wealth, to be blessed. And so what am I saying? You got to be doing something. It ain't falling out of the sky. <laughs> it ain't going to just jump out. Your, when it comes out of your spirit, it means that God, you know, the blessings in you, that means God, he, he's, he teaches you how to profit. So he's going to begin, you, you're creating an atmosphere where you can hear him clearly. He's going to give you witty ideas and inventions. He may give you small little things to do in your job. He may tell you to plan and set up to start a business. He may tell you to get your house in order, get out of debt. He may tell you to start saving so you can have a storehouse and doing things like that. So when he comes in, you know, he requires you to be a good steward. He that's faithful over little will be faithful over much. But he that's unfaithful... And what belongs to God or another man or faithful with the unrighteous mammon will be also unfaithful with God in handling his purpose in the earth. So you got to get those things straight. And you got to realize God is going to cause you to do something so he can channel the blessing in your life. Those are channels. They're not your source. God is your source. And he wants you to have channels. So some of you, you're not doing some of the things. Some of you are still um, um, showing up late for work, eating too long on your lunch break, and leaving early. That, that person's not set up. you got to fix those. And those are the things God is dealing with you about so that he's teaching you to profit. It's just that simple. It's, what, it's the small obedience, which you do day to day, those things that he's telling you that don't appear to make sense. Is what sets you up to walk in the blessing. Amen? Now, let me tell you about the story of the Shudamite woman, because we're talking about your generosity releases the blessing. Amen? Y'all know about her, right? You find her story in 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 8 through like 32. And let me just read verses 4 through 10 and I mean, 8 through 10, and then I may have to just speed it up and recap the rest of the story. But can I trust you? to go in and, and fact check what I'm telling you by reading the rest of the story. So here we have, it says, one day Elijah went on to Shunem, where a rich and, influ and, and influential woman lived, means she was whoo, had influence and she was rich, who insisted on his eating a meal. Afterwards, when he passed by, he stopped there for a meal. And she said to her husband, Behold, now can I ask you something? Isn't that sweet of her to offer him a meal and insist on it? I wonder if that was the custom of the town that when strangers come, that's just normal hospitality. Now, they made a point to say this woman is rich. Then when the Bible says you rich, you filthy rich, y'all. And she influential. Now, out of all her richness, what is a meal to her? I mean, it's nice that she's doing it. I'm not knocking her. Hospitality's good. But think about it. What is a meal, really, out of her wealth? 
Okay, but watch what happens. Afterwards, whenever he passes by, he stopped there for a meal, verse 9, and she said to her husband, Behold now, I perceive that this is a holy man of God who passes continually. Let up, because she perceives this is a man of God. He is on do, about doing God's work. He is about establishing God's kingdom on the earth. Now, before, she just thought he was any old body. And she did reasonable hospitality, but it didn't cost her nothing to feed him a meal. Even if it was the most extravagant meal. This woman is rich. I mean, that'd be equivalent to you coming up here and it's time to give tithes and offering and you go push pay and you put in a penny. Oh, better yet, a dollar. You know, the way I used to do it when I was part of another denominational church, I thought my dollar for offering was more than enough. My $2.50, I really thought I was doing something big. I really didn't think about it. I remember um, my son used to come when he was a little boy, used to save up all of his change. No, he didn't. He had a change pile, and the change didn't mean anything to him. He just put it off in the change pile. And when he gave, he took the pile of change that he didn't count, that didn't mean anything to him because he thought dollars were more precious, $5 bills, $10 bills, and he gave his change. Now, I didn't know that what he was doing, but we talked about giving something that means something versus giving something insignificant. And as a child, he was convicted and came to me, said, Mom, I've been just throwing my change in because I didn't care about it. But I see I was giving God what wasn't important. It didn't cost me anything. It didn't mean anything to me. And I repent, and I'm going to start giving him my dollars. Do you see why God is so drawn to the children and their innocence? And how easy they're touched by God. That's why we got to do everything to give in this house to make sure that our children's center can, can expand, our team ministry can expand, that we can decorate it, that we can take it to another level, that we can build even another addition. I got a whole nother room that I've been promised free. But we don't have the finances to renovate it and remodel it. But that's not going to be always, right, church? It was the favor of God just to turn their hearts and make it free. But it sits piled up with office chairs and desks waiting for us to have finances to come and renovate it and turn it into some, knock out some walls and turn it into something. Amen. For our young people. Down that same corridor. It would be the Victory Christian Ministry Children Wing. Amen. Of of Elder Charles Mahoney. Glory to God. Woohoo! Wouldn't that bring him glory from heaven? Mm -mm -mm. I can see him dancing now. Let me stay to the script. Okay, let's move on. And so once she perceived who he was, she, look at her response. She said, let us make a small chamber on the housetop and put there for him a bed, a table, a chair, and a lamp. Then whenever he comes to us, he can go up the outside stairs, and rest here. Uh, this woman building a whole addition on her house for the man of God so that he won't be tired and worn out and so he can fulfill the vision. But it took her changing her perception to see that he was a man about establishing God's kingdom in the earth for her to go into her wealth and riches and go far beyond just a meal to building him a whole addition, y'all, and furnish it with new furniture. Woo! And you know what happened after that? She got the attention of God. God spoke to Elijah. Now, mind you, he was coming to the house eating his meal. God wasn't saying nothing to him about this woman. But then she gave something that cost her something and cheerfully, joyfully gave it from her heart. Why? Because she wanted to advance the kingdom of God. And God said, okay, Elijah, Elijah, talk to her about it. She's lacking something. She's lacking something. So he sends his servant to her and found out what she's lacking and found out that, you know, she got this old husband. And when the Bible say you old, you old, y'all, you old. And she never had a baby. And, she, and that's her desire of her heart. So Elijah comes to her and says, a year from now, you're going to have a child. And she's like, oh, my God, really? Don't, don't fool with me. I've been married a long time, and my husband's old, and everything's all dried up. Can it be like that for me? Almost sound like Sarah. But one year later, she conceived that baby. The desire of her heart. 
You say, well, I don't want a baby, but maybe there's a dream or vision you've been believing God for, and you haven't seen it manifest yet. Uh, what type of seed that costs you something that God says, wait a minute, I need you to give it willingly. Only take it from the willing ones, the ones that are hilarious givers that want to. Why? Because if you sow grudgingly, it's going to come back to you grudgingly. Life is going to be hard for you. But if you come to give generously so blessings to come to others, you will reap generously and with blessings. So, yes, what dream do you need birth? And then the story goes on, and the little boy grows up. I don't know how old he was, but he's out working with his father. He gets this bad headache. They take him back to his mama. She's holding him on his lap, and he dies in her arm. Her dream died in her arm. Some of you have dreams that have died. It looked like God promised you something. It looked like it was working out. Then suddenly Satan pulled the rug from underneath of it. And now it looks like it's ashes. That woman said, I'm going to see the man of God. They said, why? She said, I'm let you know it is well. She kept her words right, and she went off to see the man of God that gave her that blessing. And now I'm telling you, this her seed, her generous seed working. And the man of God came to her house, and he laid himself on that child, and that child lived again. I'm telling you, your generous giving will rebirth anything that has died. If you've had a dream that looked like it's died, I want you to put faith behind your generous giving that it shall live again. But then that seed didn't stop working. If you go on to 2 Kings chapter 8, there was a famine in the land. And as a result of the famine, I, the, the prophet Elijah got a hold of the woman who generously gave in her life and said, you got to get out of here because there's a famine coming. You need to go over here to this land so you'll be okay because this land is going to be dry and barren. Look at that. She got a word to escape dryness and barrenness. Famine went on for seven years, and then she shows up to see the king. Nobody sees the king uninvited. You can be beheaded. And how many of you know in a famine that king takes possession of everything? But she shows up to see the king to try to get her possessions back, okay? And But keep in mind, you cannot see the king without an invitation. And just as she shows up, Elijah's servant is telling the testimony of her son dying and being raised again. And he says, well, do you know where that woman is? And the servant turns and sees her at the door and says, that's her. The king says, come on in here. Tell me the rest of your story. Look at the grace and the favor. That, that's Elijah's grace that's up on her life. She's got favor and audience with the king. Come on, some of y'all need favor and audience with the king of kings. You've been stopped up in your hearing. You're you're not able to hear the king of kings speak to you. Let your generous seed open up your spiritual ears. And when the king heard her story, he gave her all her land back. Not only did he give her all her land back, he gave her all the profits that land would have made over the seven years if she had farmed it. I'm telling you, that's a miracle. A king ain't giving nobody back nothing. And she not only got her land restored, she got restoration and restitution. Come on now. From her generous giving. Please give me 10 more minutes and we're going to conclude with the generous giving of Abraham. I mean, in her life, I mean, I got to read this to you. This is really what happened. Let's bring it up to, to our day in time under grace. This is actually what happened to her in her life. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8 in the Amplified Classic says, remember this. He who sows sparingly and grudgingly will also reap sparingly and grudgingly. And he who sows generously, that blessings may come to someone, will also reap generously and with blessing. I really feel her meal, giving him just a meal a day, was really a sparing offering. And that's why she didn't receive manifestation of her dream. But when she sowed generously she received manifestation of her breakthrough. 
verse 7. So it says, let each one give as he's made up in his own mind and purposed in his heart. God speaks to you in your heart. He's the teacher of prophet. He wants to speak to you about how to profit. He gives you power to get well. He wants to speak to you about how to empower you to get well. And he will tell you and instruct you on your giving. But when he does, you cannot give it reluctantly or sorrowfully or under compulsion. For God, what? He loves. He takes pleasure in. He prizes above other things. He's unwilling to abandon or to do without a cheerful, joyous, prompt to do it giver whose heart is in his giving. He could not let that Shunammite woman go down. He had to not only restore all her wealth, but he had to give her restitution as well. He would not allow her son to be destroyed. He restored the dream. In verse 8, what does he do? And God is able to make all grace. What do you need grace for? Every favor and earthly blessing come to you in abundance so that you may always and under all circumstances and whatever the need be, self-sufficient, possessing enough to require no aid or support and furnish in abundance for every good work and charitable donation. Now, I just read you a little excerpt of that, of that chapter. You need to read the chapter in its entirety. Paul is talking to the church to prepare them to give their offering so they won't shrink back and give it grudgingly. He is coming to the church to take up a sacrificial offering from these people, and he wants to make sure they have the right heart and attitude. And if you read the whole chapter, it goes into what else comes to you from you giving generosity. City, giving generously. Read, children. Open up your Bibles and read. Glory to God. So now let's look. Let's finish with Abraham. Amen. Let's look at Abraham, our father of faith, to see how his generosity released the blessing in his life through his willingness to tithe. Abraham was chosen by God. You know why? Because he would teach his children the ways of God so he and his descendants would continually walk in the blessing. It says that in Genesis 18, 19, in the message where it says, yes, God is speaking. I've settled on Abraham as the one to train his children and future family to observe God's way of life. Live kindly and generously and fairly so that God can complete in Abraham what he promised him. What did he promise him? That through him, all the families of the earth would be blessed. That he would bless him and make him a mighty nation. Amen? But he said the only way that's going to happen is that his children will walk in these ways. And I chose Abraham because I'm confident, God said, that he will teach not only his current family, but his future family his way so that we would follow after what he did to walk in the blessing so all the families of the earth can be blessed. How many of you know we're his future family? How many of you know, according to Galatians 3.29, we are the seed of Abraham because of the blessing? blood of Jesus. When you receive Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, you now become into the family of God and you now become part of Abraham's family as well. So let's hear what he's saying to his future family. So let's see what he teaches us about his willing generosity through tithing. So here we find in Genesis chapter 14, Abraham, do you know Abraham had to come and fight against three kings? in their army, three kings, three nations in their armies. And all he had to, to fight against them were his own personal household servants. He was way outnumbered. He just had his servants, which were in the hundreds, but he had about three, four hundred servants. But we're talking about three kingdoms that are coming against him. And do you know he defeated all three kings in their army? And as a result, he wants, and he took all this spoiling, because you know when you defeat the king, I don't know why when these people come to war, they carried all their wealth, they carried their gold, their silver, their diamonds, they bought everything. That's crazy. Why would you bring all your wealth to a war? Because whoever wins gets to take that wealth and own it themselves. So now he has all this wealth, and he's coming to meet Melchizedek, the king of Salem. And I want you to know Melchizedek is a high priest. 
And so in verse 18, we find in Genesis 14, it says, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the Most High God, which has delivered thy enemies into thy hand, and he gave him tithes of all. After he pronounced the blessing, Abraham gave tithes of all. This is before the law. There was no law, because I know there are people in here who say, well, tithing is just something we were commanded to do under the law. This is prior to the law. And then out of his heart, out of his love, out of his honor and appreciation for God, how he knew God empowered him to win against three kings in their army. He says, I want to honor God with one-tenth of all the jewels, all the diamonds, all the gold, all the silver, all the spoils that I receive from winning this battle. Amen? So he gives a tithe of all to the high priest Melchizedek. And look at what God's response is to that. See, y'all need to keep reading Genesis chapter 15. This is what God's response is. After these things, the word, I'm reading verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abraham in a vision saying, Fear not, Abraham. I am your shield, your abundant compensation, and your reward shall be exceedingly great. Because he gave generously and willingly out of love and adoration and appreciation for God, acknowledging him as his source, that God says, I am going to be your shield, your abundant compensation, and your reward shall be exceedingly great. Come on now. Your generous giving releases the blessing. And guess what? God so loved the seed of Abraham that he implemented the law and commanded them to tithe so that they would get the blessing up on him that was promised to Abraham, okay? So that all he had promised to Abraham could be fulfilled. But then we come into grace, the New Testament, after Jesus is risen, and we get to tithe out of love and adoration. That because we've come out of darkness, and into his marvelous light. God, we want to honor you. And Jesus is still Lord of the tithe after the order of Melchizedek. Let's look at Hebrews 6.20. This is why the tithe is still applicable. applicable. Hebrews 6.20. It reads, where Jesus has entered in for us all in advance, a forerunner, having become high priest forever after the order with the rank of Melchizedek. Let's read over to Hebrews 7, 1. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem and priest of the most high God, met Abraham as he returned from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. And Abraham gave to him a tenth portion of all the spoil. In case you're wondering what the tithe is, is one tenth of all your good, all your income, all your birthday money, all your blessings, all, 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 one tenth, all of your time. Come on. He is primarily as, and don't substitute time for your money. He is primarily, and don't use money to substitute as excuse for why you can't serve and volunteer. It's one-tenth of all. He is primarily, as his name when translated, into king, king of righteousness, and then he is also king of Salem, which means king of peace. You do your research in the Bible. Melchizedek's name is not mentioned anywhere else, but in Hebrews chapter 6, Hebrews chapter 7, and in Genesis chapter 14. And the only thing he was known for was receiving the tithe. And Jesus is high priest after his order. He still receives the tithe. Jesus is Lord of the tithe. The only difference is under grace, we get to willingly 
give the tithe as an act of love and appreciation towards Jesus. And our tithe declares Jesus lives. He lives in every area of our life, our finances, my marriage, my children, my health, my job. The blessing of the tithe still belongs to you, and you need to release your faith. You need to release your faith for God being your shield and your abundant compensation, your reward being exceedingly great, just like Abraham. You need to release your faith on Malachi 3, 10 through 12, when God tells you to bring all the tithes, the whole tenth of your income into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And prove me now by it, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Heaven, I remind you, is on the inside of you. The blessing is on the inside of you. God wants to empower you to get well. He wants what he put on the inside of you to show up on the outside of you. So is one blessing heaped upon another blessing, one blessing heaped upon another blessing, one favor heaped upon another favor till your head swims. And then he goes on and says, I'll rebuke the devourer. Insects and plagues. What's devouring your crops? What's devouring what you put your hands to? What's devouring your family, your mind, your health? He says, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake, and he shall not destroy the fruit of your ground. He won't destroy your dream. You got a dream. You got a vision. You got a business. You started. You ain't doing something for God. Your time guarantee that it will not be destroyed. Your children look like like they're going to hell in a basket that is the fruit of my womb and God I thank you Lord a host for responding to the fruit of my womb they will not be destroyed Satan you can't have them you better meditate in this scripture so you get some revelation how this tithing works all the way around I call it my all-purpose scripture it's an all-purpose blessing. If you don't know a healing scripture, a financial scripture, if you don't know any other scripture, you come to this tithing scripture if you are a tither. And if you're not, pray to God to help you establish your tithe. Because some of you got so much debt that you ain't got enough, and he will show you. I've had people who've asked, God, show me what am I overspending in so I can find my tithe. And God will talk to you about eliminating stuff, getting out of debt, stop buying, over buying, cut off cable, cut off this. And it's only a temporary thing because it will make sure that you live in abundance. And then it says, and I will rebuke the devouring insect for your sake, and he shall not destroy the fruit of your grail, neither shall your vine drop its fruit in the field before its time. In other words, your dream will not be aborted. And all nations shall call you happy and blessed, for you shall be a land of delight, says the Lord. I'm telling you, the power of the blessing of the tithe will open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing. You don't have room enough to receive it. As I close, I just want to tell you a little bit about our life and the power of the blessing, not destroying the fruit of our ground. My daughter didn't suffer any injuries where at 18 months, no, at four months, while in a walker, she went tumbling down 14 stairs and at the bottom was flipped upside down at the bottom. Only minor scratches and bruises. Do you know what that's like? Your four-month-old baby, my first baby. We accidentally left the door open to downstairs. 14 steps she went down. And we found her at the bottom upside down. And we heard the thumping and the thumping and the thumping. But she was well. The tithe made sure that my husband was miraculously healed from cancerous tumor at age 37. My son at age five was healed from attacks of severe chest pain. As a teen, my son, the tithe kept him from losing his mind on two separate occasions when he had an allergic reaction to medication, which he took, which took his mind to Looney Tune Town for over a week or more. Do you know how scary that is? The tithe rebuked the divine power from taking my life. With repeated life-threatening complications, I was told by the doctor because of the injury I suffered in 2007. The tithe kept me from being a cripple that here I am all these years later I'm not on a cane and I can still wear heels and I never had one day of off-rided pain and I never had a knee replacement 
the tie made sure that the birth of my grandson protected the birth of my grandson and my daughter from death, along with when they had an emergency C-section when he was only 26 weeks. Doing in the C-section was because she was suffering from uncontrollable high blood pressure and her kidneys and liver were failing. The tithe has kept our bank account from being compromised with me constantly and repeatedly leaving my checkbook at the grocery store. I used to take this big um, notebook-sized checkbook to the grocery store, and for some reason, I'd pay the bill and leave it on the counter as I would take the grocery. But no money was ever taken out of our account, and I would go home and come back, and they would have it just for me. God has brought us from not enough to just enough to more than enough on one income for over the last 30 years. He's healed our marriage some 30 years ago. So we can be here today, you guys, celebrating 40 years of marriage and meet you on the other side of the tithe working in our lives. The tithe took me from being hopeless, low self-esteem, and suicidal and saved my life because God wouldn't allow me to be given up on me. He gave me a husband that stood in the gap. I believe all of that is the result of the tithe, that the devourer was rebuked for our sake and caused an outpouring of blessing to be heaped upon the Marshall household. And I believe the Victory family. Come on and stand to your feet. It's your, it's your altar call now. It's your time to respond to the message this morning with your tithes and your offering. I've shared enough word with you right now to have more than enough faith to be able to sow into your kingdom of God, whatever he's telling you, so that you can be blessed to be a blessing. Some of you need dreams birth. Some of you need dreams that died to relive again. Some of you just say, well, God, I just want to hear you, and I'm ready to do what you're telling me, and I'm believing you for that all grace to abound towards me, that I'll have more than enough to give to every good work, that I'll stop being in debt, that I'll get out of lack, I'll have plenty more to put in store and an overflow to be a blessed, to be a blessing, because God, I want to see your kingdom come to pass, souls won to the kingdom of God. So, Father, I'm asking you right now, and as they stand before you and prepare their tithes and offerings, you are the teacher of prophet. Begin to speak to their heart. Begin to talk to them about what it takes to get to the level of prosperity that you have in their heart and what to sow. And as God begins to speak to you, you honor him, but honor him being a cheerful, joyous, prompt to do it giver whose heart is in your giving. Only those giving this offering who are giving willingly. If you feel grudging, if, you, if you're having second thoughts, don't give yet. Let God work on your heart. But for those that are willing givers, it's time for the blessing to be released. So God, as they sow, God, I thank you for a release of the blessing that they will prosper, they will increase, they will excel, they will succeed in everything good, that they will rise above anything that would hold them down. I thank you for a release of unprecedented favor, that they will see preferential treatment, special advantages, and special privileges. They will see you assisting them, supporting them, and making things easier for them, featuring them and endorsing them every day of their life because of their generosity generosity in their giving God and let it come back to them multiply blessing heaped upon blessing and favor heaped upon favor till their heads swim so people shall see us in our prosperity and say those are the blessed ones those are the people that the Lord has blessed because they've been a blessing I see how they've been a blessing in the earth God let them see us be blessed to be a blessing and as a result, God, let every dollar that is given in this offering represent souls being snatched out of the kingdom of darkness, brought into your kingdom and disciple in the household of Victory DC in the name of Jesus. Now I want you to prophesy out over your seed and command it to go and grow and multiply and suddenly return unto men. In Jesus' name, hallelujah. We want to give you an opportunity now. This is one of the most important times of the service today. 
We want to give you a chance that if you do not know Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, we want to give you an opportunity to actually have a relationship, to decree before yourself and others that, yes, he is my Savior. So we have an opportunity for you to just say, I want to give my life to Christ. If you need to rededicate your life, this is the opportunity to do that as well. So we're going to have everyone as a family because we do this as a family. We get an opportunity to just come behind each other. And if you are one who says that I'm giving my life to Christ or I need to rededicate myself, you want to come up at the end of the service. We want to, if you need additional prayer, we have that for you as well as the elders will be here to pray with you. We want everyone to close their eyes at this time. And I want you to repeat this after me because this is the, this matters. This is the, the, the point of the beginning. You thought that you were living your best life, but when you actually say, God, I give you my life, you are, you are moving into another dimension in God. So I want you to repeat this prayer. Lord, I come to you as I am. You know my life and how I've lived. Forgive me, Lord. I repent of my sins. I believe Jesus died on the cross. And on the third day, he rose again. I give you my life. I want Jesus Christ to come into my life and into my heart. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. You can do better than that. There was a, a soul snatched from darkness. There was a soul snatched from darkness. You remember when you said, God, I'm turning my life over to you. Something happened in the earth. Something happened in the heavens. So we exalt your name, God.